All right, welcome to the Rabbit Show, and we have a special guest today. Obviously, it's Andrew Trinkwater. I've been talking about him since uh, forever now. I always wanted Andrew on the show, and here he is. Andrew Drinkwater is uh, the CEO, obviously, of uh, the Player Analytics. He's the co-founder, and uh, uh, he will be talking a lot about his journey about Player Analytics. You can see I have uh, played. Uh, uh, logo in there. Obviously, we want to know more about how he has founded that community. And this session is for him at, about sharing his journey about uh, data, about how Canadian universities, because he's kind of very close to the Canadian universities. So, want to know more about it. And without wasting any more time, let's have Andrew on line here. Hey, Andrew, thank you for joining the Robert Show. You're very welcome. Yeah. Good morning and good evening. Thanks everybody for joining us. Amazing. So uh, we have so this Andrew is uh, on LinkedIn and YouTube. It's dual streaming. Obviously, you know about it. But uh, just for the audience, um, I just wanted to ask you one thing that uh, uh, for the questions asked in the session, what are the audience getting out of this? Uh, you had offered something, right? Yes. Um, so we are offering a prize draw. Uh, Ravi, I don't know how you select the winners. I assume it's random, um, but we're offering a prize draw in partnership with our friends at Lights On Data. Um, so George Firican and Donabel Santos, who probably are, are live with us now today, uh, have kindly offered up, hey, good morning, George, um, have kindly so, yeah. offered up a seat to their new data visualization and storytelling course. Um, so that's going to be our prize draw today. Um, and we're, we're excited to partner with them. I've signed up for the course myself as well. So I'll be learning alongside you over the next couple of weeks uh, for the lucky winner. Um, Amazing. I, used to, I used to teach with Donna Bell at the British Columbia Institute of Technology. She's an outstanding teacher and I've followed along George online and seen some of his videos. He's great too. So it's an awesome prize draw. Uh, I'm not going to win it myself, but I'll be there alongside you as well. So it'll be a lot of fun. Oh, yes, looking forward to it. And surely, I know George, George has been around. His videos on lights and data are amazing. He's one uh, person whom I know uh, since a while now, but uh, enjoy his stuff. And then there's Donna Bell. Obviously, I know her things. I know her YouTube channel. She's doing some amazing stuff. And definitely, uh, Andrew, we know you all. So, but uh, it's such a uh, amazing uh, you know, just a feeling to have you here because uh, we want to talk. I always wanted to know more about played analytics. And that's when I reached out to you as well that, uh, okay, please tell me about played analytics. And I wanted to do a show about it. And here we are. So we have a few comments coming in. We have a few people who have joined in. Uh, I will just, let's just greet them. Giovanna is here. Hi. Hi, Giovanna. You're from Milan. Hello. Uh, so Giovanna. George is here. Sure, hey, George. <laughs> and then Zayed Hussain is here. Hey, hey Zayed, Hadid. thanks for joining. Yep, Jana. Oh, okay, she thinks the prize is awesome. Obviously, it's one uh, I, I wouldn't have missed. I wish I had that chance of winning the course by <laughs> Donabel and George. Obviously, these two are top data governance folks, uh, and I love their work. So, Manpreet is here. Hey, Hi, Manpreet. Thanks for joining. Thanks for joining. <laughs> Yes. Hey, we have Donna Bell. Hey, Donna Bell. Morning, Donna Bell. So nice to see. Yes. Uh, welcome, M. Is here. Morning. Hello. <laughs> Donna Bell is the best teacher. Yes, indeed, I guess. <laughs> Tenam is here. So, yeah, uh, Andrew, everyone is here. Everyone's hearing to wait your story. I know it's kind of like a spotlight <laughs> altogether. <laughs> But uh, tell us something about yourself. How the first thing is it your first LinkedIn Live session and YouTube session? If I'm not wrong, this is my first LinkedIn Live and first YouTube Live. So I feel so famous, and it's amazing what we can accomplish in 2020 uh, working together digitally. This is pretty cool. Uh, yeah, a tiny bit about me. Uh, so my name's Andrew. Uh, I am one of the co-founders of Plaid Analytics. We're based in Vancouver, Canada, and we help universities, colleges, governments, and, and related organizations, people who work with education data and want to be successful with it. Um, so people that want to make better decisions based on data and who don't want to get bogged down by inefficient processes like 
say, downloading an Excel file from a cloud service and combining it with something from on campus and doing a whole bunch of manual manipulation. And four weeks later, your decision maker has the answer to the question that they've long forgotten that they asked. We try and automate that pipeline, make it easy for people and make it so they wow. can spend their time in the flow trying to figure out what to do next rather than trying to figure out how to put the data together. Amazing. That sounds like uh, some good automation that you're doing at Blade Analytics. Mm -hmm. And uh, I guess uh, definitely what I encourage everyone is to ask questions around data automation about your journey, what they want to know, how how long it's been. You know, you're building up uh, Blade Analytics and all of those things. But getting into Blade Analytics, I had another question for you, which I thought uh, uh, would be around your background. Uh, did you start off with? Uh, data science uh, particularly or how was your early days how, how did they look like great question um, the answer is kind of uh, so, or it depends, was one of my favorite phrases from a business prof, uh, Ian McCarthy, who, who I learned operations from. But uh, the it depends comes in in a few different ways. So my academic journey began in a program that was a Bachelor of Science in Information Technology. So my specialization, yep. if you will, was software engineering. But it wasn't quite my taste, at least at the time. Um, so I finished that. And I ended up moving towards more business oriented things. So on the professional side, um, one of the weirder experiences of my undergraduate degree is that it was part of a different university that got shut down and taken over by what is now Simon Fraser University. Um, and so while I learned some IT stuff in software engineering, which was valuable, I actually learned an awful lot outside the classroom about what a merger and acquisition is really like and what it's like when plenty of staff who you you like and respect end up losing their job through no fault of their own and some of them get hired back and some of them end up in other places uh, and it was it was a really peculiar learning experience that um, that you could only get at that moment in time really uh, what it did for me though as a student is because there weren't as many staff um, through this transition as maybe otherwise there would be well SFU yeah. was figuring out what to do with this place um, and what programs would be there it created opportunities for student leaders so I became a president of the local wow. student society got involved and, and in large part was a conduit of information between the students and the professors um, because when you merge programs and organizations there are different effects on different people. So I got involved because of that, became an academic advisor and got in, stumbled my way into data um, because we ended up enrolling way too many students way too quickly. Government funding doesn't typically keep up with that kind of growth. And so suddenly we had all these students and nobody to teach them. We had to solve that problem. So that was how I got into analytics uh, in the first place. Wow, this is kind of a very cool story. And trust me, uh, uh, Andrew, I have a sim similar story where I belong to finance industry myself. I had mm. a background in finance. And yesterday itself, when I was on uh, George's show, I, I, you know, I could recall the same things where uh, I started off with finance and uh, someone in the comments actually suggested me the same thing. Why don't you get into data if you are so close to data and the community? So I'm like, uh, that's something which I need to think about. But uh, definitely. Mm this you you guys are some inspiration you Jeremy Revenel is one of the guy who's building NAS and these people in the community are inspiration where you don't need to think much if you are from finance field or some other field mm. it is about entering the field and enjoying it and learning out of it and you started in your early days which is uh, super inspiration but just a few questions uh, that are coming in from a few folks uh, so we have more folks who have joined in Okay, Aishwarya is here. Hello, Aishwarya. Uh, good evening. LinkedIn user, we don't know what it is, <laughs> who it is, but uh, okay. So, Christopher is here. Hi, good morning. Hello. We have Silesh Jane. Hi, Silesh, how are you? So, everyone's here, but uh, there's this question from Jishan Uh What about freshers? How can they start their journey in data science? And this is one question which has always appeared on my show and yeah. every time someone uh, you know different asks because that's uh, a, a very genuine question which i think is how what is the first step okay do mm. your degree in science and do what what is next what is the yeah. right field to get in okay yeah so i i assume from the yeah. question that freshers is somebody new in the field um 
And so I, I'd have a few responses to that. So one is there, we always think it's going to be this perfectly straight line to get into these careers. And it rarely is. It's usually more like that. Um, and it, it can loop back on itself sometimes. And sometimes you have to move laterally to find the right fit. Uh, but what I'd encourage for people just getting started in their career is a few different things. So one is uh, do your best to get involved in information interviews. So talk to professionals in the field and ideally at the kinds of companies that you'd like to work at. Um, what I've discovered is data science is a really broad discipline and what it really means depends heavily on the company that you're working with. So talk to people in the kinds of industries and the kinds of jobs that you aspire to be and learn what they do. This will help you understand the role for one. And for two, it'll signal to people that are in the market that you're interested in growing into this capacity. So even if they're not hiring right now, they might be in the future or they might know somebody who is and you taking the step of reaching out and saying I'd like to learn about what you do is a good first step to beginning that process so that's one the second one um, is do the best you can to understand the kinds of data that you might have a chance to work with so maybe you want to work in retail understand the customer of the business that you would like to work with um, know everything you can about them because it'll make you a better data scientist on the other side. You'll be a customer champion and help to understand that that data. Um, the last one I'd say is just read. Uh, this can be really hard when you're fresh out of school. At least I found it took me a while to get back to reading. But the more that you understand about the world, um, the more opportunities seem to emerge themselves to you. So personally, I've set a goal to read way more books in the last, call it two years, approximately, than I have in years before that since finishing school. And it took a while to get back into it, but it's really enjoyable once you get going. So yeah, network with information interviews hone your expertise in the industry that you're interested in, especially around the customers and what matters to them, and then read, learn more about the world. Great yeah, question. Yeah, exactly. I think that 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 makes a lot of sense. And uh, this is one of the best answers I have heard, uh, Andrew, because <laughs> you've detailed it so well that uh, these are the things that, you know, points you've put it so well. And uh, Donna Bell felt the same thing. And that's what she says. She says, it can be a winning role, <laughs> well put. That's a great advice, Andrew. Exactly. It, it makes a lot of sense for people who are just entering the field and they want to know more about data science. So get to the experts, talk to them. They are welcoming enough. Our data community, I've seen you, George, Donabel, everyone out there, Kate Strachny, anyone, reach out to anyone. They're the sweetest people. They will help you out. Mm. If, if not, if they don't have the right information, what they'll do is direct you at the right place where you can gain some amazing information and I think that solves the problem for everyone so okay we have another question from Joanna that is what is the biggest challenge about working with data in education field now this is your playground I know <laughs> this is this is definitely my day-to-day -day. Uh, thank you very much exactly. for the question Giovanna I, I think probably the biggest challenge that I see is uh, education institutions have a lot of data. Uh, depending on who you ask, it may or may not be characterized as big data, um, in part because of the veracity. Uh, but generally, they're getting closer and closer, and particularly as online learning becomes mainstream now in a way that it has not been up to this point, I think you can make the argument that institutions now have to grapple with big data. But many of them lack a combination of tools, resources, and expertise to take advantage of it. So there are processes that are still more manual than staff would like. Um, many jurisdictions in the world have had cutbacks over the years. And so the existing staff maybe have stayed, some have left, uh, but they ultimately haven't really had the extra bandwidth to learn all the new things that they want to learn. So they're having to pick and choose. We try and help them with finding uh, tools that will get them a quick return on investment and allow them to kind of automate some of the pieces that they feel are being done in a hard way right now uh, so that they can focus on answering the why questions. Why does this matter? Um, and spending more of their time on that rather than you know corralling different spreadsheets together, that sort of thing. I'd add a second challenge is more of an emerging property. So in Canada, we've been loosely familiar with this for a long time. In, in the case of Canada, we have 10 provinces and three territories. And 
Yes. For the most part, they all have different privacy regulations that apply to educational institutions and the data that they hold. And so we're used to this kind of approach that it really does matter where you are. Um, but what we see is that uh, instances like the uh, general data protection regulation in the European Union, there's one coming in California, similar ideas, I forget the name, and many other jurisdictions around the world are really tightening up how data can be used by by companies and educational institutions. And so adapting to those new rules and having a proper data governance program in place that works well with those rules in different jurisdictions, I think is an emerging challenge uh, that's been starting a few years ago, but is gonna be bigger by next year and the year after. Great question. I think that, that yeah, exactly. That, that made a lot of sense in everything that is in the education field. We are close to knowing about data from other industries, but this is a complete new industry. And it is actually important to know how education system is working into data. And also one of our topic area that we'll be talking about is how uh, the Canadian universities are actually battling the, uh, the COVID uh, scenario with data mm. and how are they leveraging data? So that obviously we'll just go, uh, we'll take those questions a little later, but uh, sure. uh, the, there's another thing that uh, George was talking about was about player analytics and George knows about player has been doing something around the UBC and heard amazing positive feedback about it. What is it, what is it about? Uh, can you just for, throw some lights on both for UBC, what have, what else? Yeah. Um, well, thank you, George. That That's really kind. Um, so just, I guess I should be clear that we, we haven't actually worked for George or the department that he works in. So this is, this has traveled around campus a little bit, which is super flattering. Um, the project that, uh, that we've presented on publicly before that I think I can talk briefly about is we helped UBC's faculty of medicine, which trains in particular trains doctors. They have other programs as well, but the part we were working on was with, with the doctors in training, which are known as residents. And so we helped them forecast the future of how many different residents would be in different streams of uh, of medicine. So things like family practice, which is your standard family doctor, um, but there's also you know surgery or internal medicine or a number of other, there's tons of disciplines, way more than I realized um, from the outside. Uh, there's a huge amount of specialization. So we help them build out a forecasting system, including the foundational layers of getting your data from an operational system into a proper data warehouse uh, so that you can make better decisions both on your current data, but also better predictions about what may happen. The unique part of, of residence and training at this time anyways, is it's a little bit um, a little bit like an apprenticeship where you put in a certain number of hours in certain clinical disciplines in order to get your accreditation. So if you take a leave, say a medical leave or a parental leave or something like that, it means your program extends. So predicting them is a little bit different than predicting students. And then the other unique part is that residents get paid during their training. Um, so they're not a full doctor yet, but they're close. They work in hospital hospital sessions, that sort of stuff. Um, so they have a different financial cost structure than a standard student prediction would too. So it was a really fun project. We worked alongside the IT team in the Faculty of Medicine and we all learned so much together. We're really happy with how it turned out and it's nice to see it, uh, it, it happening for real now. Thanks, George. Yeah, and, and, and I think, you know, uh, when you are actually working out there for healthcare you feel that sense of proud as well when it's coming out from played and uh, it's yeah. actually doing something which is which will benefit the healthcare system so i know completely how it feels uh, uh, we had an interesting comment from balka hakem he says i have experienced mm -hmm. the same losing best friend due to merger <laughs> so that's that's always there what, one of the interesting things, though, is I'll, I'll say to that comment is a number of years out, it's amazing to see what those people achieve in other settings. So in the beginning, it can be a little bit hard. You lose people that you enjoyed working with and collaborated with. But over time, they spread out around the world in different organizations and you start to see flavors of that inspiration that you saw, but it's impacting more people in a positive way. So in the long game, it can actually be good, but it's really difficult at the, at the time. It's a good comment. Yes, makes sense completely, Andrew. I think we have another one which is about startups and which actually focus. Since we are talking about played analytics, uh, Manpreet says, with time, there are many startups coming up in the field of data science services. How do you make your work stand out? Which is very interesting. Obviously, we would love to know how does play 
looks at things differently and some things which are common everywhere that those best practices and how has your entrepreneurship journey been till now? Great questions. Um, so in terms of how do we make sure that our work stands out? I, I think the first answer is actually that I'm still learning. So we're almost four years into this, but we're always learning new ways to help our work stand out. Um, so what you may have seen from me recently, if you follow me, is that we're trying a lot harder to share publicly some of the knowledge that we've gained from other projects. So we do webinars now about monthly, give or take. We're getting into workshops. Um, we've got YouTube videos and we're, we're starting out the idea of a blog, which we've been aspiring to for a long time and we're now starting to build up. So that'll be launching more towards the new year with our, wow. with our new website. Um, the entrepreneur journey has been actually a lot of fun in ways that I didn't anticipate. I, I won't lie to you and say there hasn't been difficult days too, because it, it's really exactly. different to go from having somebody pay you every two weeks consistently without a worry to suddenly you have to learn how to sell what you can create to other people who are willing to pay for it. And, and selling always sounds a little bit weird until you remember that ultimately, if I can solve your problem for you so that you get the credit for it, then we all win. Um, and so when you think about it like that is, I'm really just a helper. It's not that different than when I was an academic advisor telling people which courses they needed to finish. It's not that different than when I worked within a university saying, if you change the deadline for dropping a course, it's gonna cost the university this much, but it'll give students a chance to see how they're doing in the course. Um, and when I look at it that way, I'm actually just helping other people, trying to understand their problems and trying to provide some solutions based on my expertise. And if I do that well, it doesn't feel like sales. It doesn't feel like promoting my work. It feels like helping somebody, which is actually what I enjoy doing. Um, but yeah, the, the entrepreneur journey is really interesting. Um, I definitely encourage you to read more on it if you're considering going down that road. Uh, the advice I have is that you have to have a little bit higher tolerance for risk. And if you don't have it, find a way to help yourself understand it. So in the beginning, I had a lower tolerance for it. And in my mind, I said, okay, well, if I have a low tolerance for this, I need to be able to say that it, over the course of three years, I wanna be at this level that I couldn't do on my current path. And that's how I taught myself to handle that kind of risk. Uh, the other part is network with other entrepreneurs because believe it or not, even though sometimes they feel like competitors, we all wanna be successful in this space and we're happy to share learnings to help everybody be successful in this space. So reach out to others. I'm happy to connect as well. Uh, feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn. Oh, definitely. I think Andrew is one guy who everyone should just go hit a friend request and talk to him because he's uh, he's the sweetest out there when you talk about data, when you want to know about his journey, when what he's done, what he's not done for himself, everything, the good practices, everything. Just go reach out to Andrew and he's your guy when you want to talk about data, something serious. Obviously, we can see it right now <laughs> how he, things have worked for you and how do you look at things very differently. So there was something around Plate that was asked by Alok Chilka, or what was your motivation oh. behind starting Plate Analytics? And just a small gist about the strategy behind it. If uh, yep. obviously the strategy is, you have to share that startup strategy. I know there's always, there are many strategies that run in a company, but uh, strategy that the world should know that this is how maybe, you know, uh, you can start up your entrepreneurship journey or anything that yeah. you can share. Great questions. Okay, so in terms of the motivation behind starting Plaid Analytics, uh, one of, so finishing a master in business administration was one of the components of that. So I was surrounded for two years by other people that were entrepreneurial and we came up with all kinds of ideas on how we could change the world. So that helped uh, in a big way. The other one that I would say in my own particular circumstance is I had moved to a new job uh, at UBC as George mentioned. Um, and my business partner or now business partner was at a different university. We used to work together previous to that. What we found by dividing um, so that I could get a new opportunity really was that we kind of watered down the talent pool of people trying to move an organization forward in terms of making data-driven decisions. And it became at the time, so this is going back a ways now, but it became a little bit more difficult to convince people when you are sort of one voice in an organization saying you need to make decisions based on data rather than being a team of people reinforcing that message. And so we started pondering about whether we could actually deliver that message better as independent experts from outside the walls rather than inside. 
that was a big motivation for us. And the other big one was kind of, I, I'd always had a soft spot for small colleges and I wanted to find a way to help them. And they couldn't afford, typically couldn't afford a professional at the level that I was at full time. And they didn't need somebody full time. They needed somebody like 10 to 20% to help with particular projects. So this was a neat way to be able to help smaller organizations who couldn't build up their own data science team, but actually help them get to the same level as big players like say UBC. Right. Um, yeah, yeah. The, the basic idea is we wanted to help universities, colleges, and governments because we saw a lot of people were struggling to use data successfully because they had not received the training, they didn't have the time, and we thought we could help with that. That was the big gist of our strategy in the beginning, and we've grown from there, and it's still our mission that we want to help educators work with data. Yes. So are you just uh, putting it to Canada, or do you go want to actually, obviously, you want to take it to many more countries? We do. If yeah. You, which is your next actual path, which is your next actual country that you're looking at and has a good market? Yeah, so for, for us, we started in Canada, primarily the Western half of Canada and grew from there over the last kind of four years. Uh, in the most recent year, we've got our first American customers. Um, so that's really exciting for us. Um, and so we'll, we hope to expand more in the US uh, in the coming couple of years, but there's other markets around the world that have education systems that have some similarities. We think we could help. Um, so so other other countries that have an education system based on, on the UK in some way, shape or form. Uh, so the, the UK itself, obviously, Australia, New Zealand, uh, potentially India. Um, there's, there's a number of different places where the systems resemble each other in some ways, and we think we could, learn the local market and be successful but i think it's a multi-year multi-year game to get there as well yeah definitely for the long term i think obviously you can reach out to places you just i think the the common base between education is just understanding at what level they are and how you can mm -hmm. sync up your complete uh, company in there and you know you can help the universities and i think that should be a good win-win so uh, talking and I think about maybe uh, the one other piece about education is to remember that like healthcare, it's not quite the same as a, as a fully corporate business. There's a social good component, whether it's a yeah. public funded institution or whether it's a private funded one, there's still a social good component that operates differently. So um, consulting yeah. to a private enterprise versus a university, they value different things at different times. And I think that's why specializing in this kind of space is really important as opposed to serving many markets, or sorry, many industries at once. Um, that's yeah. why we wanna have an expertise in educational data in particular. Yeah, exactly. It makes a lot of sense, Andrew. Can't wait to hear your stories, maybe just, you know, after a year or two years, I know this will be something which is, people are looking at it very closely and yeah, fingers crossed for you. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's great. There is this question from Costop. Uh, when do we know when to start automation in data science? What I mean is, do we know we have matured as a data scientist and move towards automation? That's a tough question, actually. I, I, I think I would encourage some responses from the audience as well, because I feel there's some experts in data science that are probably in the chat who can chime in. Um, my own inclination is automation is really important when you find that you're spending more of your time doing things that could be better done by a machine. So it's not that you're not capable of doing them. It's that if you spend the time to create the, the algorithm or the script or whatever is appropriate in your context, to be able to have the machine run that part for you so that you can put your creativity, energy and insights to work against more complicated problems, that's when automation is really, really helpful. Um, the other thing I've heard in the data science community is that uh, knowing you're mature as a data scientist is when you're able to effectively bridge the gap between your business users. So often the people who make decisions and who don't really speak a geek, if you will, um, and the deeper technical users. So maybe you're working with like a data engineer or a data architect or something like that, when you can easily traverse between those two audiences and help them successfully communicate with each other. To me, that's when you've really matured as a data scientist and you're not just building models because it's interesting. Wow, that, that makes a lot of sense. I hope that helped uh, cost up. And actually, I think also it depends on how good you are uh, into the complicated problems and how 
much obviously you have that experience in hand so that will make the difference and i think it depends on person to person every individual might look at it very differently this is your perspective anyone else might have a different opinion about how you've grown as a data scientist so nice question cost of interesting because this is just a very different question we have a good question from mm. aishwarya what are the major skills one should develop and work on it to become good at data analytics yeah yeah um so the ones that really jump out to me uh as much as there are some articles that say it's no longer around i found having a, a functional or a decent set of skills in uh structured query language or SQL goes a really long way, especially for your first couple of jobs. Uh, the next one is having visualization skills. So things like understanding Tableau or Power BI to be able to present information visual or, or a number of other tools as well. There's Shiny and R and there's ways to do it in Python, et cetera, et cetera. Those are really good. Having a foundation in some kind of programming is also really helpful. So what I'd say is know at least two languages because it makes it a lot easier to learn subsequent ones. So Python and R are really popular in data science right now, but there's others as well that you could learn that might be beneficial. And once you've learned a couple of them, it gets a lot easier to jump between different languages because you start to see the patterns. Um, those are the biggest to me right now. And then the fourth one that seems to be coming up more and more on job descriptions and in interviews is, do you have any experience working with the cloud? So learn something about Amazon Web Services or Microsoft Azure or Google Google Cloud Platform or, uh, or Alibaba. Um, those seem to be the biggest four. Oracle is in the mix somewhere as well. Um, but learning more about cloud services and how to, how to turn your work into more microservice oriented pieces uh, seems to be a growing field, but I, uh, but it's only just beginning to emerge in education from my vantage point. Well, that's, I think that answers the fair question definitely because everyone out there uh, is looking for something which is different, but then these might help Aishwarya, that is for sure. So we have an interesting question from Neerat Satpal. What is your recommendation where CFOs and other senior executives demand more results from data analysts? when they expect higher returns and a larger number of reports, all kinds of data? That's a really interesting question. And I, I've always found that finance professionals are among the most interesting to work with because they, they often think about the world in different ways than other experts do. Um, and I think this is in part because of the requirements of their job and in part because of their personality. Um, just the way that they view the world is a little bit different than some other people that you work with. Um, so in terms of the large number of reports, one of the things that can be really helpful is actually asking key questions like, does this report matter anymore? Um, are you still using it? Or what question are you trying to answer with this report that isn't currently possible? What you may discover by approaching it that way is that in fact, your existing 700 reports could be collapsed down to 350. And you could actually answer more questions by modifying your existing, 350 is still a really large number, but you get the idea. You could answer more questions by modifying a smaller set of them, and you might be able to achieve more results that way and make it less overwhelming for your users as well. But there are some C CFOs who really just want more tables with the appropriate numbers. And sometimes you work with them and you start small and you say, okay, well, we'll make the table, but what we're gonna do is we're gonna also make it visual so that the visual learners in the finance organization or elsewhere can quickly identify what hotspots they should be looking at. Um, it's the same thing that you can see just by glancing at the number because you're well-trained in this, but for other users, they don't know to look for it. So we're gonna help them find it with, maybe it's highlights, maybe it's key annotations, maybe it's putting a better title on the report so that users know what to look for. Uh, so I think there's lots of different strategies you can employ there, but if you ultimately aim to get towards how can I better help the people who need to know this information answer questions that they have as fast as they can answer them, that's really where your win is. You want to get there. Wow, this is some very detailed answer and very quick, uh, Andrew, and uh, I really love this answer. But also the folks, I, I don't want to miss this out. I hope uh, Neeraj uh, liked the answer and your uh, what how folks are actually liking your answers. Oh, thank so you. Aisha says, thank you. George is here. OK. So we have welcome. He's like, you're on lit. <laughs> George is loving the show. Donable loves the interview. 
So you there, you answering, and it's amazing. You have been fantastic, Kelo, and I can't see because obviously we have that time restriction. But we'll mm. go over and above, and we'll talk about all the things what people want to know. Because uh, I hope Andrew, you can wait back for like some more time and give sure, us that yeah. those uh, special insights. Yeah. yeah. So there was one question from Manjunatha. Um, for those with significantly mm. on. analytics experience what are your recommendations to gain industry relevant analytics experience for lateral transition mm. yeah that can be that can be tricky sometimes um so what i would say is there are a number of different communities online that you can join uh the one that i'm most familiar with is makeover monday uh which takes an existing chart and turns it into something more visually compelling um but depending on your industry there may be more targeted groups and what i'm getting at here is that these online communities often have sample data sets that relate to the industry that you're trying to build experience with and most employers um as long as they can see that you're able to execute on the kinds of data that they work with that's a respected thing you don't necessarily have to have 5 years of experience working for a professional company in this capacity maybe you have to have some number of years of experience working with that kind of data um remember that you're you're trying to be better than the next best candidate when you're interviewing for a job you're not you're never going to have 100% of what they're looking for you want to have some room for growth too so you need to be the best of the available options and one way to demonstrate that is with a public profile that shows that you've worked with that kind of data so that that's probably the best advice i'd have The other one would be to talk to people that work in the analytics function in your organization and find out how they got into their jobs and what they'd recommend for skill building. Wow, super cool. I hope that helps Manjunatha and definitely those are uh, a few things for your groups you need to reach out to and you know keep that learning going on. But I had a controversial question for you. I know that would be difficult but I have it. Which language is best to be a data oh. scientist? So <laughs> Python R language. <laughs> um my preference is Python. but i think that's because i have a computer science background more than anything else i think if i came from statistics i would prefer r what i can say is that they're both super powerful there's a lot of overlap in terms of what you can do with them now it's not 100% but think of a venn diagram that has a fairly a fairly large amount of overlap i would say that pick one and get relatively good at it and then it's helpful to learn the next one but which one you pick first look at the one that looks most appealing to you or the one that's most common in the job descriptions of the industry that you want to move into great question and hard to answer <laughs> yes <laughs> i know it's like the controversial question and uh, folks actually you know uh, guess to come on board they like okay if such questions are coming up we don't know how to tackle them because sometimes it's both sometimes they have a preference and then they are judged over it but uh, thanks matthew for, for uh, thanks andrew for actually being this honest about it so yeah okay no there was a uh, one mm, question about books obviously since you're coming out and you uh, recommended that reading books is something that you like as well so are you sugar wala uh, mm. how many books do you read in a month and which is your favorite book um Right now I'm reading 2 to 3 per month. I'm trying to get that up to uh up to 4 per month. So there's a book a week challenge by uh Christina wow. uh I'm blanking on her last name but I can put it in the chat after this. Um yes. apologies for that. Uh she was on the uh on the dedicated conference recently. So I'm doing the book a week challenge. Um that's a good way to get started and to challenge yourself. I also actually because I'm a data nerd, I actually time myself for reading. And so my goal is in about January I want to see how much time I put in over the last 2 years and how many books I've completed and my goal is really I want to do half an hour per day. Uh and if I can do that then I'm going to be reading at least a book per week, probably a little more than that if I do half an hour per day. Uh favorite book recently um is Shoe Dog by Phil Knight. So he's the founder of Nike. It was fascinating to read about a a founder who numerous times cheated a uh, cheated company death and barely made the payroll by 3 hours and even even when Nike did their public offering he still felt like 
he was going to run out of money any second, even though by any objective measure, he was very successful financially at that point. And just learning how other founders think, I've really enjoyed books about founders lately. Um, but that's the one that stands out at the top of the list. Uh, my favorite book in general, the one that got me started in this field is Competing on Analytics um, by Tom Davenport. Uh, so if you've never read that, it's a released a new version recently. It's a good read. Um, yeah. Amazing. That's super. I think those are the list of the books that uh, obviously everyone would like love to know. So what I can do is obviously share those books in the comment section or maybe when uh, Andrew goes out and looks at those comments after the session, whenever he gets time, he can actually answer them and put yeah. that list down for uh, folks to actually, you know, have a look at those books. And if anything that can help them, definitely. Why not? And I, I agree about the uh, Week a challenge about the book by Christina. So here it is. This is book a week challenge, which uh, Christina does. Go follow it, and definitely this is one of the best things I think one should start with uh, when they're starting to read books. I follow very quickly, but I don't know how. Hmm. How it's very Thanks. difficult. It's very difficult to read a book in just. Uh, you know a week uh, how can someone do i know i have a book i have a book you know just besides me people skills for analytical thinkers by uh, gilbert yeah recently launched amazing i've just started off but then obviously i'm not a technical guy but then it this is not a technical book and it's uh, very much mm -hmm. for everyone i do read books but in a week, uh, it's not possible. I take at least a month to read a book because yeah. obviously we have so many things on our plate and then then that's what I start wondering, how how do people do it? But it's something one should do and definitely a very good practice to start with. The okay. key for me has so, been deliberately reducing yeah. phone usage in favor of reading. Um, so I'm comparing the amount of time I'm reading to what the phone says I've had for screen time and I'm trying to get them into yes. more of a semblance of balance. You'd be amazed how far that can go, at least it did for me. Um, so yeah, quite enjoyable yes, exactly. from a data nerd perspective. <laughs> <laughs> I get it. And think Tinam mm. Tamang says, yeah, I believe in reading book is one of the best way to understand the topics. I'm also on one same path. Thanks, Andrew. I, I definitely agree. Book is obviously I work in pack publishing. I'm doing those books. I closely work with authors and I know I see that importance when people start reading books, they get into it and they learn so much out of it. And yeah, that's very important. Okay. Talking about that, I had another question about uh, obviously the Canadian universities that we, that is the main topic area, which I always wanted to touch. How is it? Uh, that Canadian universities are actually, you know, leveraging the data and helping mm -hmm. to battle with COVID. What is right. that uh, thing which is different from the other fields? Right. Yeah. So there are close to 300 universities and colleges and polytechnics in Canada, depending on how you count, but something like that. In the span of three weeks, starting in mid-March, um, every single one of them moved almost all of their offerings online. Uh, the exceptions to that would be certain mechanical trades where working, work, you can't you can't build a car uh, without you know touching it kind of thing, and certain healthcare disciplines where duty of care is required. But everything else went online in a very short period of time. There's been bits and pieces that have come back in person, but in really small capacities compared to the past. So what we saw in terms of how universities, colleges, and governments were using data during the pandemic was a, a few different things. So one is planning courses. So if you're going to start bringing students back on campus, you have to keep at least a two meter distance between students. Um, and you have and depending on the jurisdiction, you might have had rules on how many people could be in a building per hour, that kind of thing. So we saw really interesting ways of looking at data, including things like every 15 minutes, how many people are in this building? Are we above or below our COVID capacity? And for above, we have to do something to change it. So that's one. The other one is with everything moving online, suddenly, everybody's using a learning management system in some way, shape or form in a way that they didn't use it before. So there's tons of information coming from that. Um, and it can be used to help with things like intervention. So maybe a student looks like they're having to repeat material a lot of time in the online management system, or maybe they're not coming back frequently or something like that. Maybe that's a signal 
that they're struggling with the course. And so maybe you could reach out and, and provide an intervention that could help them be successful. The note of caution there is that 2020 is a really weird year for all of us. We all miss our family, we miss our friends. We, we even miss in-person meetings, which isn't something that too many people would say, right? Um, and so students are going through exactly. a lot. So if we're gonna use this data to make decisions and potentially intervene with students, we need to be really cautious that what we're interpreting is the signal and not the noise. So, you know, proceed cautiously sure. with that. Uh, and then the other part is just integrating public health measures into institutional reporting in ways that traditionally they haven't needed to use uh, is probably the other big one. Great question, Ravi. Amazing. I, I always wanted to know about it and that's one of the things so Donovan says, love the answer, depending on how you count. So typically in a data world, we need to know definitions before some things can make sense. Exactly. <laughs> Thanks, Donovan. There's a there's so, a joke in the institutional research community that says, how many people in a university does it take to answer the question of how many students do we have? Um, or how many answers to that question are there? Uh, and it's always more than one because everybody has a slightly different definition on what is a student. Are they full time? Are they not full time? Et cetera, et cetera. Always fun. Yes, definitely. <laughs> I get it. <laughs> OK, so there's another question from Joanna. I wanted to take this. Uh, what was the project that helped you learn sharpen your analytic skills? I, like maybe the initial one or maybe the current one. Which one is it? And how did it help and which one was it? Mm. Um, I think maybe I'll harken back to an earlier question about a CFO, that one of the biggest learning experiences and biggest learning curves in my career was when I got in deeply involved in trying to forecast revenue. Um, so up until that point, I'd been forecasting students, um, which is challenging in itself, but forecasting how much they'll pay to the university under different scenarios involved a lot of learning. Um, it involved adopting new tools. It involved understanding accounting in ways that I had never previously spent a lot of time with. It involved understanding financial needs in a different way. Um, and in particular, uh, reconciliation and deltas. Um, so, you know, why has why has the output of this scenario changed by some hundred thousand dollars since the last time that we looked at it? What's different? Uh, ma almost matters more than how much. Um, what's different and why? Uh, so for me, projects that involve answering questions like what's different and why promote the greatest amount of learning. Uh, and I find I often learn it in collaboration with, in this example, it'd be the people that worked in finance, but it, depending on the discipline, it could be others, but we can learn more together essentially. Sounds good. I think that's, that definitely answers Joanna's question. Uh, there, there was another question from Frasin. Uh, it was just uh, a general question, obviously. There is there are there any specific procedures to solve any given data problem, or just one? Ex just explore and come to a conclusion. How does it work? That's a good question. Um, so there are some frameworks uh, for going through data uh, that are that are worth exploring out there. Uh, personally, I'm an advocate with start with the question in mind. Uh, so what question is somebody trying to answer and then see what the data tells you. But there are other times where it is actually exploration. Um, so some people call this exploratory data analysis, other, others call it ad hoc. It's usually pretty similar where you spend some time looking at the data and saying, what is what is expected about this? And in particular, what is unexpected about this? So what's different than I imagined it would be? And work your way towards helping people to understand those things that they didn't expect in the data and just summarizing the things they did expect so that you can build some reliability. But I don't think there's a one size fits all approach. I think there's many different ways of looking at data, um, but I'd encourage you to to explore it and get involved with communities. So the other, the other big thing is look at how other people solve the same kind of problem that you were working on, you'll probably learn something from their approach too. And they'll learn something from yours. Yeah, exactly. It makes a lot of sense when you're learning together, it's a different story. And when you're reaching out, obviously you're consulting with the experts, it's uh, another level story. So uh, we are almost to the end of the show. If anyone has any uh, leaving questions, go for it. I am sure everyone has enjoyed this session, Andrew. It was amazing. But obviously, before leaving, I have uh, one or two more questions for you, which I can't uh, let you go without. Um, uh, so about uh, something about paid analytics, I wanted to know was uh, 
uh, in the next two years, where do you see plate analytics? I know you want to go global. Definitely, those are on the cards. But uh, I know everyone has that anxiety when you are an entrepreneur <laughs> and you just started in, and you will you feel that oh, you you giving me global, uh, you know, tag. I will get there. But uh, definitely, for next two years, what do you think uh, are your plans with plate analytics, and how can people actually go and look at plate analytics? Where are the you know the products with the, uh, and the courses that you're creating for institution where can they go and uh, reach out right so our our website has most of the information it's at plaid.is um yes oh yeah there we go so uh, some improvements are coming soon to that website as well so there's yeah. there's some stuff that uh, that will be will be showing up soon um <coughs> excuse me in terms of uh, of the courses, the intention to start with is we're going to be offering uh, training, data visualization training, customized to professionals that are in higher education. Uh, so that's where that's where we're going to be going next in terms of our training offerings. In terms of our product offerings, uh, we want to get people to the point that they can work with education data quickly, easily, and automatically. And so, my hope for the years ahead is that you'll see more efforts from us devoted to helping people build scalable solutions that will solve not just their current problem, but many problems down the road that they're trying to investigate so that they can spend more of their time in the analytics flow and more time deciding, OK, what do we now that we know this about our population uh, or now that we know this about our forecast, what do we do next? How can we influence that to have the best outcome for, say, the university or college or for the student or ideally both? Um, so I think that's where you'll see us going uh, over the next couple of years is more and more down the path of scalable data solutions for higher education that are built by people that know higher education deeply. So that's my goal. But at the end of the day, if I have clients who say those folks from Plaid really helped us solve a problem that we would struggle to solve on our own, then I've done my job. I'm pretty happy with that. Does that answer oh, the question, yes. Ravi? No, definitely that that answers <laughs> uh, but uh, definitely what I can't wait is to see play doing how are you guys playing around in the next six months because I think building is the most difficult part and obviously the execution later is uh, there but still it's manageable now is the time what you're creating if you've done in the past as well and you've bought play to a, a level where you can stand for itself and you can speak so much about it and uh, you're doing wonders for it. We can't wait to see the new courses coming up. And also before leaving, <laughs> we had a good comment from George and he says uh, you should bring Andrew back again if you can, Ravit. Obviously, we, everyone I think here wants you back, Andrew. Uh, maybe in the next six months I'm coming back to you and I'm asking, uh, you know, just for your calendar time that uh, uh, you need to be here. We have a few comments from uh, folks who have asked you questions about how smooth you were with answering and all of those things. And, I really uh, appreciate everyone ahead. taking the time to be here. You've had you've had great questions, and I hope you found this insightful. Feel free to reach out anytime. I'd be happy to chat. Uh, thank you, everybody. Really, I appreciate it so much. And thank you, Ravi, for hosting me too. Oh, definitely. How can I not? You are like actually an inspiration for the data folks. You have shared such amazing insights. And trust me, this would help us all in, in you know, getting closer to the education industry as well. And to play analytics, uh, you all are doing wonders and all the best to you. Just before going, uh, yeah. are we uh, going ahead and uh, calling for the winners today or do you want to take it later later you want to go through all the questions and then you might pick one how does it oh, work uh i'm i'm happy to draw them randomly now if you want ravi you've got the list of you've got the list of people um <laughs> or if uh, we're I, right I, at the tail end I, of our time maybe we should make it a follow-up um yeah i'm okay either way i think i think what we can do is uh best is to just go uh go for it later Okay, and sure. there are more comments coming in from Kunal, Aditi. So amazing insights, amazing show. Thank you, everyone, for joining in. And Andrew, especially you, thanks for joining my show, coming on the show, taking your time out. I know how difficult it is for you to, obviously, you're in that phase of, and it's morning, early morning, and I'm just 
there and bang it's like uh and do you need to be here and all of those things but uh, you've you've been very kind in answering all the questions you've been the most honest guest on the show you have not uh, you know been <laughs> anywhere uh, close to in manipulation whatever you feel and whatever your opinions are you've kept it uh, very straightforward to the audience and i think that that is the fun of the live session so yes uh Thank you, Ayush. Thank you, Ashish. Everyone for joining in. It was fun, and um, thank you very much, everyone. So, see you next time. Okay. Next time. Thank you for talking about my T-shirt. Here is my T-shirt, uh, the Robert Show. And yes, everyone, I'm just putting it uh, somewhere on a website where everyone can have a look, and if they like it, they can buy it. So that's happening soon. So both thank you and Ravi. Looks great. <laughs> Thanks everyone. Thank you. Ciao. Bye bye.